Glad to be here with y'all. Looks like we got a good number, and that's always great. I'm going to get into a lesson today, and I'm probably going to be a little, little boring. I've got a little Greek to go over. <laughs> I don't really understand all of Greek, and I can't pronounce all of it, but it's important today in our lesson to look at a couple of words because <clears throat> when we rise up out of the water of baptism and the Lord adds us to the church, we have been added to the Lord's army. It talks about us being soldiers. It talks about us being added to the Lord's army. When we're added to the Lord's army, or we have a job, and maybe at the school system, or at the mail system, or at other places that we have, we have duties. There are certain duties that comes with that job. So in the army, our duty is we raise our hand, we swear, we protect the country, we respect the ranks, and we salute, we have duties that, that, that we perform. It's the same way with a job. We have to do these duties on this job in order to be pleasing or successful in that job or in the school system. We have to do that. So there's three areas. Just a, a, a fundamental study of the Bible will show that there's three basic areas of Christian duties. I, and one of those is our duty to ourselves. We have a duty to ourselves to be faithful, to be pleasing to God, and these things that we do to have, be pleasing to Him have that. The second one is our duty to those around us. Our duty to those around us. And the third one is our duty to God, to remain that way, to remain faithful. Each of these is important in itself, and it's very important for us to be right on the side of God. Two of these, I believe, are preached on pretty regularly. One of those being our duty to ourselves and also our duty to God. We know that one must be baptized to be pleasing to God. We preach on that quite a bit. You hear a lot of preaching on baptism and the importance of baptism and why the baptism is important. And those are all really good lessons, and we need those lessons very much so. And we also hear, just as we did at this Lord's Supper that we just had, they read from the Bible that the command that we need to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We're told that. We're also told in the Bible that we're to meet on the first day of the week, not forsaking the sin of the saint. And we preach on that. And if somebody's not coming regularly, boy, we give them right off the bat. You know, you need to be here on Sunday. You need to be regular. We'll talk to you. All of these things. But nowhere in the Bible does it say this is a commandment. Do, do you know that? It doesn't use that word, commandment. But it does, Bible teaches by what? Direct commandment. It teaches by example. And it teaches by inference. All four of the things I named are commanded through the teaching of the Bible to be followed. Baptism, Lord's Supper. Give on the first day of the week as he read in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Set aside. We're told these things. But that second one that I read, our duty to those around us, you don't hear a lot of preaching on that. You don't, you don't, you don't hear a lot of preaching on that. And that's the one I want to focus on this morning. And I want to use that because it says this is a new commandment. We look at your Bible at John chapter 13. At verse 34. John chapter 13. At verse 34. It says, A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. What, why would that be a new commandment? In the Old Testament, in Psalms, you study Psalms a lot. What did David do to his enemies? He always prayed God take care of them. Give them out of his hire. Do something with them. Exterminate them. You know, but that's, this is a new commandment. That we love one another with that. And it also said, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. 35 is the interesting verse. This is the one that's a little surprising, you might say. It says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. You know in the Bible does it say that you can find that uh, you're being baptized, everybody knows you're my disciple. 
Uh, you take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. They don't know you're my disciple. But here with this, a new commandment that you love one another, this is how they know you're my disciple. Who is they? Is this telling God that by us doing it? No, it's not telling God. It's telling the people in the world. It's showing the people. This is not a divine order. This is a human test. It's a human test. That we love one another. And I submit to you this morning, that's a hard test pass in this old world. It's a hard test pass that we love one another. It, it really is. When, when, when you think about it. But this shall all men know, by this shall all men know that you are my disciple if you have love to one to another. Also, you also love one another. If you have love one to another, they know this. I want to spend a few minutes on this. And it is surprising that it is a human test and not a divine test to know that it is a disciple that we are that shows our love for God. One of the things I've been preaching now for, I don't know, coming up on 18 years, maybe 19. I did a little preaching up the Cold Spring before. And I've been in the Lord's Church for about six years past that. And one of the things that I have seen a lot of times is that the people outside of the Lord Church, one of the things they talk to me about and one of the things that I've had conversations with people and they say, I didn't feel no love in that church. You ever had anybody tell you that? They come to church and visit, they didn't, I didn't feel no love in that church. They wasn't met at the door. People didn't come to them and talk to them like, they, like, like we're supposed to. And not only that, this is the real kicker. It's easy sometimes for us to love somebody that just comes in the door that we don't know a lot about. They might be good looking, might dress snazzy, might suit you in some other material ways, physical ways, you know. But what about someone that don't? What about somebody that's a little obnoxious? What about somebody that's a little hard to get to know? What about somebody that may have different ideas on some things, expedient things, not, not spiritual things, expedient things, like the color of the carpet, like the light, the wattage of the light bulbs, or what's on the hook, expedient things, different from you. That gets a little harder to do. And people see that. People see that we don't love one another as maybe we should at times. And that is this test, that we love one another to show that we love God, that we are His disciples with that. that, that's, that that's a hard test. And I know that people may think, well, you know, it's not really that hard. But love is the base on, on which rests every duty that we owe God and man. You remember in Corinthians? When it tells you what? Faith, hope, and charity. And what is that charity in Corinthians? It means love. Which is the greatest? Love. Love. Charity. That's exactly right. So all these other things rest on that. When someone comes in that door of any Lord's church, I, I'm not, just, not just New Harmony, but any Lord's church, how do they feel? What do they see among the brethren? Are they clicks? There's these little few talk to them little few, and these little few talk to them little few, and you prefer that? If we're going to quit that, and if we're going to say that we love each other equal, then God probably needs to remake us, okay? Because we're human. And there is going to be some that you get along with better than others. It's human nature. You've got something in common with them, or... Or, or you do the same work, or, or, or you like the same movies, or, or, or you read the same, I mean, many different things. That's why in the Bible, in the King James Version translation of the Bible and some other, they have done a terrible, terrible translation of the word love. In the English language, love is, I love a fan attorney, I love beef, I love to ride, I love to travel, I love this or that. And we think because of the tone we use or what we know in our mind, we're talking about how much love they have. 
And that's not the way the word love in the, in the original writings of the Bible was used at all. There is so many different words for love in the, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, specific words. The love of a husband and wife, specific word. The love that you have for your children, a specific word. The love that you have for your brethren, a specific word. And then in Matthew, over in Matthew, it tells us, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, tells us that we have to love our enemies. We have to love our enemies. Now, who believes that that word love there is the same word that it says God loves us? If you love me, keep my commandments. Who believes in it's the same word? It's the same word, L-O-V-E. Love. So how are we supposed to distinguish someone that doesn't know the Bible, someone that maybe doesn't have a good vocabulary, someone that maybe doesn't understand a lot of the English language, how are they to the devil? To know. Do we really believe that God has told us to love our enemies like we love our brethren? I've had a lot of people tell me that. Hey, you cannot love them any less than you love your brethren. You cannot love them any less than I love my wife. You cannot love them any less than you love your children. And that's not true, little sisters. That's not true. <clears throat> that word, that word tells us to love our enemies. That means to like less, love less. There's a whole other word for it. I'm, gonna go, I'm not going to get into all these great words because I couldn't say them right, no way. But you can take your concordance and you can go to that verse, Matthew 5, 43. You can take the word love. You can go to the concordance. You can look love. And it'll tell you what Greek number. It'll probably be, I'm going to say, a copy Greek uh, 26 and 25. One's a copy and one's a gopo. And it'll tell you what that word specifically means in the Greek. And we must understand how that goes about if we're going to love like the Bible tells us to love. We are to love completely. Agape is to love in a social or moral sense. It is a deliberate exercise of the will. Of the will. That is our Christian duty. I am to agape y'all. Y'all are to agape me. That's our Christian duty. I don't agape my wife. I follow her. I love her different. I love my grandchildren and follow different. And those words are important. And you say, well, why can't we just love? Because people believe that we are to love our we are to love our enemies the same way we are to love brethren. And it's different. Brethren, we are supposed to have a special love for each other. That's what makes us, this new commandment makes us a peculiar people that set aside like baptism does. Like we're taking of the Lord's Supper every Sunday instead of once a year or on a birthday or, or on a special occasion. That's what sets us apart. How are we to know one another? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. That's why we need to know the difference. That's why we need to be able to explain the difference. You don't have to get into Greek to explain it. You can say, it's not the same word. I know it's not. We can sit down. If you have time, let's sit down. Let's open the concordance. Let's get the Greek out. And let's go after it. Most time when people go to talk about Greek, people go, I don't want nothing to do with it. But that's what language this book was wrote in. Do, do we understand that? This book was not wrote in English. It wasn't wrote in English. So when we try to take words, wine's a good example. I ain't going to get into that today. It's a perfect example too. <coughs> Hell is another one. They use across the board. It means three different things. There's several places, and we need to know the deeper meaning of that. To have that. Because we must have the kind of love that we are supposed to have for that. Philo is to be a friend, a natural affection, and the word for husband and wife is actually, it's, it's a form of philo. I've got a whole bunch. <laughs> I have to write it down. But it's P-H-I-L-A-N-D-R-O-F. Philandros. That's the love of a husband and a wife. Not love. Not L-O-V-E. It changes the whole meaning of things. When you read in Titus, it's a really good place. Titus chapter 2 
at verse 4 is talking about the love of a husband and wife. It uses this word right here. Titus chapter 2, also at verse 4. It's talking about the love of the children. That's P-H-I-L-O-T-E-K-N-O-S. Philotechnos. Love. That's what they translate love. But it's different. It's, it's different. I know a lot of people that may be educated said, look, well, I know that when the Bible tells me to love my wife, it's different than love my brother. Do you? Do you know it's different than to love your enemies? They tell us to love our enemies the same way. It's not true. It's just, it's not true. We're to pray for our enemies. We're to like our enemies. And I, I tell you something else, too, that, that, that people does a lot. I think, myself, <coughs> and that is that they tolerate people. You ever heard anybody say that? I don't really like that. You can't do that. <coughs> you, you either love your brother. What's first John say if you don't love your brother? You what? You hate him, don't you? You hate him. <laughs> you can't. You, you can't love someone and hate them. It's important. You cannot be righteous and be unrighteous. You cannot battle <coughs> offense. You get your preachers home. And I believe I remember our daddy is saying just that thing that he got his preachers home in the fence. You cannot be in the light and be in the darkness. Doesn't work. You cannot be that. You cannot be right and be wrong. You cannot be wrong and be right. You cannot agree to disagree. You ever had a religious conversation with somebody that got to a point where they told you, let's agree to disagree? And I said, no, I can't do that. What, what do you mean you can't do that? <coughs> You can't just agree to disagree on this subject. No. Because it's a spiritual. It's a subject that needs to be the truth taught on it. It's a subject that one must believe what the Bible says on it, not what you think on it. We cannot do that. We cannot be bold. We cannot do that. There, there's a story. I, I, I read Guy in Woods uh, wrote an article, and it was about a Civil War man back in the Civil War. He was called up to fight for the northern side. Well, he went in. He didn't want to kill nobody, and he sure didn't want to get killed. So he come up with a plan. He put on a northern jacket and Confederate breeches. So he thought this way. Neither side would shoot at him. They wouldn't be sure. Well, they found that man. They went into battle. They found that man after the battle dead. He had a southern bullet in his northern jacket, and he had a northern bullet in his southern pants. He was trying to be bold, and they both shot him. We can't be bold to people. We're either going to be the brethren, we're either going to love them, we're going to love them like God tells us to love them, or we're not going to be right with God. Do we realize that? A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Now, I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to come every Sunday. I'm going to partake of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to give them my means. But I'm not going to love them. Really. I don't have to. You can't tell me. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. I can tell you because the Bible just told you so. The Bible said it. What's that old preacher say? The Bible said it. I believe it. And that's it. <laughs> the Bible said it. I believe it. That's it. There ain't nothing no more. No further. So how can we say it and how? Thoughts. And, and you know what? The Bible tells us that Jesus is what? God is the discerner of our thoughts and the intents that we have. So we're sitting and we're having thoughts about someone, a brother. 
And we think we're loving it, brother. We think we're doing what the Bible tells us to do. We're not. We can't, we can't have that. We can't have that on us. It's not going to work. You're not going to hear those words, enter in thy good and faithful servant. We're not going to do that. This is just as important as any other part that we can think of. If not more so. If not more so. We need to understand the command and a principle and matters of expedience. We need to understand the difference on that. A command, a direct command, is this what we were given to love one another? Is you can't get over it. It's ungetting over. You can't go around it. There's no going around it. Now, if someone comes in here and says, you know, I don't really like the color of that carpet. And they're new, and you know, you're trying to do the best you can. And so, well, you know what? Just what color do you want? Well, I want blue. Sounds good to me. Let's put blue carpet in. It don't matter if that carpet's green, blue, what, whatever. I'd say, let's get one that don't show dirt or worse. Would be, would be where my mind would go, because I hope it's going to get a lot of traffic. You know? But those things don't matter. Those expedient things don't matter. But brothers and sisters, a direct command matters. A direct command matters so, so much. And when we say we tolerate somebody, we really need to set aside the time to talk to that brother, to study with that brother, to study myself, to show that I'm on the wrong path, that my mind is not thinking right, that I need to do something different. And you know, one of the things, it creates a stumbling block. And you know, the Bible tells us we don't want to be a stumbling block. You remember that in Romans, they was dealing with a meat that had been offered to idols and and they asked him, and they said, no, there ain't nothing wrong with that meat. That idol made of stone and wood, it, it didn't do nothing to that meat. That meat's just as good to eat. It, if it hadn't sat there too long, it's good. But my brother believes that that meat is tainted. That because it's been offered to an idol, it's bad. So what am I going to do? I'm hungry. I don't eat that meat. But it's going to make my brother stumble. You know, I really don't want to give up on this idea because I think that's the way it ought to be. And, and I really want to make sure that I do it the way I want to do it. But my brother and my sister, I make a stumbling block. But well, they don't see it that way. And it's really not a direct command. It's not taught by inference or example. It's something that I prefer. Do you see where we're going? We can't do that. Each and every one of us and this church will grow more, and the Lord bless it more, and every congregation around, and I preach it at Mount Vernon, we are to esteem everyone in this room better than ourselves. What does he tell us? Least will be what? And first will be what? That's what he tells us. So when we esteem ourselves or or, or strive to put ourselves in a position that we shouldn't be in to begin with of authority or doing something because we feel so strong about liking it this way. We're wrong, brothers and sisters. We should esteem each other more than we esteem ourselves. And that's hard. You know them two old personal pronouns? I and me. They don't exist. In the brotherhood of the Lord's church. It's you. It's us. We are the congregation. We are the church. That's what exists. And the stronger we feel that bond, and the more we love one another, the better it will always be. And not only that, but what happens, as I spoke earlier on this little bit, what happens when an outsider comes in? And they don't feel that. They don't see that. They go out the door. They go down to the store where the people gather. That I use. I use Robbie's store out there on the mountain. A lot of, a lot of people gather down there. They got chairs out front. I say, yeah, go down to the store. And they tell them people in this community what kind of folks we are up here. 
I went in there and them people just didn't do this. I didn't feel no love and they was bickering and carrying on and these things that happened. That hurts the Lord's church. What goes outside that door, you think they don't ever talk about it no more? You think it's done? Well, the first place they go, they get a group what they going to talk about? They going to talk about it. That's human nature. We need to know that. So when they go outside that door, I tell them about my friend, they go outside that door, they need to be telling them people what a loving bunch of people they are, how they love one another, how they work for one another, how they esteem each other more than them, their self, and how the truth of God's Word is spoke and talked about and stood up for. These are the things that they need to be talking about. Amen? You know, these are the things. And that's what it is. A new commandment I give you. Go over to chapter 14. 15, I'm sorry. I was in. Go into 15. It says, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. You can go into 1 John. You, you, let's turn over there to 1 John. Uh, you go to Titus. You, so many different places you can go. 1 John chapter 3. That's what we talked about just a minute ago. Beginning around verse 14. 1 John chapter 3. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in hate, abideth in death. Whoso hateth his brother. Now, that, that word hateth in Greek, that means to detest. Whoa. Now, that's getting a little closer to home sometimes about how we feel about people like I detest that person. I didn't say I hated them. Detest. Love less. Love less. Detest. That's and you can look his words up. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now wait a minute. You mean that if I detest that person some and I don't have the right love, I'm a murderer, and guess where I'm going to go? What's it say? Eternal life. That's talking about the good side of life. Not the bad side of life. That's what that's talking about. That's how serious this is. This is serious. Verse 16. Who by, hereby, perceiveth we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. Man, you ain't telling me I gotta die for that fellow that I don't even like. If something comes in here, I'm not to step in front of them. If somebody comes in that door right there and says, hey, preacher, we got you taped, you've been a preaching on homosexuality, you've been preaching on boys, you've been preaching against gender, you've been preaching about this, you've got to go. You ain't going to get up in front of them. I'm going to run back in. I ain't going to jail. I ain't going to share that burden. You know, I tell them from the pulpit, and I tell y'all, somebody comes in here and I'm in this pulpit and they arrest me, that next man better get up. And when they arrest him, that next man better get up. And that next man better get up. That next man better get up. That next man better get up. You better get up. And then when all the men's gone, you know what, women? Y'all better get up. And y'all better teach and preach the same thing to the women in here. Not of certain authority. I'm not saying these women preachers. But they can teach. They taught in the Bible. Who taught Timothy? The oracles of God to begin with. Did not his mama and his grandmother, Eunice and Lois, was it? Teaching? You see how serious this is? They have been 70-something preachers arrested in camp. Already. That's right. For preaching what I just mentioned, homosexuality, gender. This woke, what, oh, there's so many stuff out there. Mom. I can't keep up with all that. But preaching against it, 70 something of it has already been done. Now, I believe God was giving some support to someone in Canada that had some trouble with the law or some issues. That's in Canada. That's what's happening. It was in Europe. 10, 15 years ago, now it's in Canada, guess where it's going to be next? We don't think it'll ever come through that door. I'm telling you right now. It will. And the love that we have for God's Word and the love that we have for each other is what's going to keep us together. It's what's going to hold us together. 
Can you imagine the love the brethren had when they took a hundred of them and put them in the Colosseum in Rome and they tied them between horses and pulled them apart and they put them in there and they turned lions and beasts in there to rip them apart. Nero put them on a cross in his garden and put flammable fluid on them and burned them at night while he walked around laughing, showing them with his friends. I wonder if we had that choice. Would we push one of our people sitting beside us in front of us? If we know this is going to take one more. Or would we reach up in the front end? front of us and pull the other one back and step up and take his place. That's the love of the brother. What which would it be? You think about it. You know, we are a spoiled, shameful generation in this country. We really are. We do not know what it is to be tested in any way. We've got way too much food. When we go to the store, we don't go to the store just to buy something. We want the brand we want, don't we? Well, I don't like this brand. I want this brand. I don't like this cut of meat. I want that cut of meat. We're sports. I just wonder, when we talk about this commandment, to love one another, how deep it goes. How deep do we really love one another? I tell you what, and I pray, and I hope, and I pray about it. We never have to find out anything like that. I hope we can go to the store 10 years from now and buy the cut of meat we, we like. I hope we can do that. I don't want it to be any other way. But it could very well be. But our love for each other cannot, cannot be like that. We cannot pick and choose what we're going to love. We cannot pick and choose how much we love them. We have to love them a lot. We have to love them. We have to do that. We completely, 100% have to do that. There are so many places. You can turn to the book of Titus, and it gets into it. It gets into some of this. There, These words are used interchangeably in the book of Titus. As we looked at there just, just a little bit, Titus chapter 2. I've got so many. And then we're going to end up... John 21. But right now, I, I, I want to look at Titus just a minute because I, I mentioned it earlier and I, I want to read it to, to show that I wasn't uh, spouting off something that wasn't in the Bible. It says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and there's that love, that word, Phila, Philolandros, Philolandros. I know that's wrong if somebody listens, but that is that word. And, and it's the philo, it's love their husband. It comes from the base word, root, root word philo. And then there's also in that same verse it says, <clears throat> to love their children. And that's a different love too. That's a different word. That's, that's a different love. So you're not to love your children the same way that you love your husband. It's a different love. The love between the husband and the wife is a, God's special love. That's the special love that God granted us that we have. And the Bible teaches us why we have that and you know, and why we can marry. And it tells us it's better to marry than to burn. So we have that. And that's that special love that God has given us. And we need to understand these things that is different. And <clears throat> because it is a different thing. When you look at uh, Chapter 3 at verse 4 says, But after the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, that love there is final. The deep love. That's what that love is from God to us. That's a whole different word than the other two words up. It's a special love that God has for us, and He has given us these things. Over in the book of John, we'll go back to the book of John, chapter 21. Here in chapter 21 is a place where these words are used both. Both. When Jesus is asking Peter, <clears throat> Simon Peter, there beginning at verse 15, he says, So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, 
son of Jonas, lovest thou me? That word lovest there means agape, friendly love, brother love. Greek. Lovest thou me more than these? Talking about others. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. That love there, Peter's using five love. Both of these words is in that same verse. You go on down to 16, it says, He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? That's a copy. Again, Jesus used the word of copy. It goes on, he says, saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. That's Philo. That's Philo, the deep love. I love thee. I love thee. Then he goes on down to 17, he says, He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He changed that love of style to Philo. Simon Peter had told him twice already that he followed him. That he had the deep love for him. And in the last verse, Jesus showed the same deep title and love for him. This is the best place in the Bible where you can see both of these words used like that. And how one went one way and one went the other. And lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things that thou knowest that I love thee. And I love the I didn't read the complete verse every time, but that was Philo too. That he and then in 15, 16, and 17, Jesus said something after each one of these. He said, Feed my sheep. He wasn't talking about the flock of sheep Jesus had from the ten on those sheep. He, he didn't have. He's talking about this congregation. He's talking about the Lord's church. Feed my sheep. Tell them the truth. Preach and teach the truth that I've left you. Brothers and sisters, I got more. <laughs> I, I guess you'll have enough of Greek and all that stuff. The bottom line is that love is the base on everything. You take your Bible and take in a, a uh, concordance and look up the word love and love us and see how many times and how many verses in the Bible that it is used in. It is used in 1 John more than just what we read. It's used in many, many different places. It's so important for us to love one another. I, I submit to you that it's a new commandment. You know, Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't use that a whole lot, a new commandment. You know, when he was talking about uh, divorce and remarriage, he went on to say that this is Moses did this with the hardness of your heart and he not uh, 19 9. And then he said, if any man any puts a woman away except for adult, adult, adult sex or immorality, then you cannot remarry or anything. And then later on in that, he said, I'm going to go a step further. You can't even look upon a woman in lust because you've already committed adultery in your heart. See, he made that even more binding. Moses would turn to Moses. Here, here's your divorce department. Go, you, know, you don't like what she makes biscuits. You know, go get you another. And a lot of times, the reason that was based upon that was if you study that, that Moses gave them because of the hardness of the heart, but a lot of times they would actually kill a woman if they could get, get separated from her if they desired another one so bad. They had that right to, to be harsh in that way. But we have to love one another. And when we teach, when we teach on these things, when we teach that you must be here every Sunday, when we teach that you're supposed to be in the right frame of mind and examine yourself to take the Lord's Supper, when we teach that you are to give your means as you've been prospered, when we teach that you must be baptized, when we teach these things, it's what faithful gospel preachers are supposed to preach and teach. And faithful teachers that goes in these rooms, they teach the Word of God, not their thoughts, not what they think right, they teach the word of God. This is a new commandment that you love one another. If there's any here this morning, and if anybody has any questions about this, believe me, I've got the ammunition. So if you have any questions about any of this, or if you want to talk, or, or, or you think something I've said is an error from what the Bible teaches, then please, by all means, I want to be right. I want to be right in God's eyes. So if something I've said is wrong and erring, 
bring the Bible, book, chapter, and verse, and I'll be the first one. I'll be the first one to tell you that I'm wrong. I stand up to everybody. I'm wrong. And then I understood that, and I learned that, and I'm going to make amends. So if there's anyone here today that's not, that has never done the things one must do, before you can have that love of that brethren, before you can be in that new commandment phrase there, to be in that line, you have to be in the member of the Lord's church. And before you can be a member of the Lord's church, you have to be in obedience to the words that God has told us in the Bible. He tells us in Matthew, he says, if you don't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. And the Ethiopian eunuch made the great confession when Philip talked to him in Acts 8. He says, I believe. One must believe, develop a faith and believe. Faith is developed by hearing the Word of God. And <clears throat> we do that in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That's what we preach and teach is the Word of God. Once we believe, we confess that Jesus Christ is Son of God and we repent. And I think maybe sometimes that's the hardest thing because I believe everybody in this room today believes in God. I believe everybody in this room confesses, will confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I don't think there's one in here that would not say that. But repentance is not becoming perfect. It's not waiting until you get something out of your life and then I can be good enough to become a Christian. That's not what it is. Repentance is having a change of mind. And you could even say change of heart if you want to, but this is what you got to change. This is a blood pump anyway. A change of mind. I want to do right. I want to live right. I want to learn more of God's Word. I want to start doing that. I want to turn away from the dark and turn to the light of God's Word. That's what it is. And when you do that, then you become a proper candidate. My grandson used to give me up and down the road when I used to use that word. I believe he said so from right here before. A proper candidate. But that's what you are. Because if you're not a proper candidate, you're going to get in this water. I used to carry a bar of soap when I got it this morning. I thought, it's okay, you let it take back. Because that's all you're going to clean. You ain't going to clean your sins if you're not a proper candidate. You're not going to clean your sins. That's not the way it works. But then when you get in there and you're proper candidate and you're Lord in the water of the baptism and you arise, a new creature, Romans chapter 6 tells us, walk in newness of life, the old man of sin put off, you're a new person. But then, guess what you can start doing? You can start loving your brethren. That's the new commandment tells us in John 13. Then you can do that. And it's not something you're going to get perfect. Okay? <laughs> And 1 John tells us what? If we say we have no sin, we'll what? We'll lie on We all fall short of the glory of God. But thanks be to God, we have an avenue to take care of it. If it's something between you and God and it's personal, take care of it between you and God. Go to God in prayer and take care of it. If you obey, you have that option. We read in our first about what he hear, who he hears and who he don't hear. But if it's something that has brought shame or reproach on the Lord's church, if it's something that the outside has seen and known, and then you need to come forward, we've been ready to help do that. If you've never accepted God's word, if you need to be baptized, <clears throat> if you need to study, if you need to talk, please come. We're here. Together we stand and sing.